What is going on, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back with the box office breakdown for Sunday, July 7th. And I should warn you in advance, I'm a teeny bit hungover, and we're in the middle of a uh, massive heat wave in New York, and my AC can't keep up. So if I look like I'm sweating or unusually pale or that it just might croak at any second, those are my reasons why. But we had an interesting weekend at the box office, or at least it was a, an interesting weekend at the box office if you like children's animation and sequels, because all those did real well. However, I shouldn't be too, I guess, cynical or too gloomy, because in spite of the fact that movies like Despicable Me 4 or Inside Out 2 are continuing to dominate movies that I'm not remotely interested in seeing, we did have some interesting counter-programming available to us. Like Maxine is the third movie in a franchise, but at least... You know, even if I was ultimately kind of unsatisfied with the overall experience, at least it's an R-rated kind of horror film with a little hint of eroticism and that sort of thing. But if you want my full review for Maxine, I'll include that down below. And we also had the release of uh, Kill in limited release, which is a brutal, hardcore, R-rated action movie. And I don't know how wide the release was for Kill, but I'll also include a link to my review for that down in the description below. But uh, this week, I think a lot of writers that I uh, typically use for these box office breakdowns might be on summer vacation, but luckily Pamela McClintock over at The Hollywood Reporter has us covered with her article titled Box Office Despicable Me 4 Rules July 4th with a $122 million opening. Maxine scares up $6.7 million. Elsewhere, Angel Studios' Sound of Hope, The Son of Possum, couldn't replicate the success of last summer's sleeper hit, Sound of Freedom. And as is always the case, these numbers might continue to be refined and finessed through tomorrow and uh, prepare yourself for frequent interruptions. But let's just dive right into her article where she says, Illumination and Universal's Minions franchise isn't getting any worse for the wares. Despicable Me 4 ruled the 4th of July box office with an estimated five-day domestic opening of $122.6 million from 4,428 theaters, including a three-day weekend haul of $75 million after earning a stellar A cinema score. That's in line with expectations and a strong start for the fourth outing in the main franchise and the sixth in the Despicable Me slash Minion series, which ranks as the top grossing animated franchise of all time. Overseas, the newest movie has cleared $230 million. Now let me pause for my first interruption. I've never seen a single movie in the Despicable Me franchise or Empire at this point, if it's the top grossing animated franchise of all time. Uh, when I was at CinemaCon back in uh, April, they showed us like an extended 10 minute scene from this latest movie. And it definitely seemed very polished, very slick, very fun, but definitely very innocent. Am I just being the world's oldest curmudgeon by refusing to kind of open up my heart to this, uh, to this series? Or is it more or less what I've always assumed what it is, you know, uh, a very fun, very, very popular franchise for very little children. So y'all tell me, if anybody out there has seen all six of these goddamn, goddamn movies, let me know if I should get up to speed because it doesn't look like they're going to stop making these movies anytime soon. But getting back to the article, the first Despicable Me opened over the July 9th to 11th weekend in 2010 to $56 million domestically. The series then shifted its release earlier and became a 4th of July staple. 2013's Despicable Me 2 likewise opened on July 3rd, a Wednesday, and posted a five-day debut of $143 million. That was followed by a $120 million five-day holiday start for the threequel in 2017. In terms of the three-day weekend, Despicable Me 4's gross of $75 million marks the highest July 4th opener since Illumination's Minions, The Rise of Gru collected $107 million in 2002. That can't be right because that would be earlier. Hang on. I think that's a typo. IMDB Rise of Gru 2022 is when that came out. They just forgot the two, but that's all right. We will not throw stones at Pamela McClintock for missing or getting one digit wrong in our article. But um, yeah, Jesus Christ, all these movies, they're so fucking popular. <laughs> I guess at some point I'm going to have to watch them. But getting back to what she says, and the third best of all time behind Gru and the $83 million earned by Despicable Me 2 over the holiday weekend in July 2017. I hope I'm not uh, stuttering too much as I try to say despicable. There's something about being tired and hungover where my lips just don't want to um, cooperate when it comes to all the, that those S's and P's and whatnot. But you get the idea. Despicable Me series is the, uh, the way it's described. I just um, having a little trouble stutter, stuttering and mumbling today. 
Now, I'm going to skip her description of the plot and her overall synopsis because I truly could not care less. But again, getting back to the article a little lower down, Chris Renaud, co-creator of Minions, or is it Renaud or Renaud? Anyway, Chris Renaud, co-creator of the Minions, directed the movie from a script by Mike White, the White, the White Lotus, and Despicable Me veteran Ken Dario. Patrick Delage co-directed with Illumination founder and CEO Chris Melodandri, producing alongside Brett Hoffman. The fact that it has a screenplay by Mike White is huge. I mean, Mike White... I think he wrote School of Rock for Richard Linklater, but I really enjoyed season one and season two of The White Lotus, but obviously The White Lotus is going after a slightly different audience, but congrats to Mike White for getting a payday. I'm sure the payday he received for writing this movie is probably like the, like the equivalent of a lot of his other jobs that he's had over the years all combined. So yeah, when, uh, when Illumination comes to Colin and says, will you write this latest uh, children's animation movie? You say yes. The movie is the second back-to-back -back win for the animated family marketplace after Pixar and Disney's Inside Out 2, which finally fell to number two in its fourth weekend, with an estimated three-day weekend gross of $30 million from 3,760 locations for a domestic gross of $533.8 million, the third best showing ever for an animated film in North America, not adjusted for inflation. Last weekend, it joined the Billion Dollar Club and Global Ticket Sales in record time, or 19 days, after posting the biggest domestic debut of the year, and this weekend, it passed up menus to rank number five on the global list of top grossing animated films with a cum of 1.217 billion, including 683.3 million overseas. Holy shitballs, that is serious money. I mean, these days, there might not be a lot of movies coming out of Disney that I'm excited to see apart from Deadpool and Wolverine or Deadpool versus Wolverine or Deadpool 3, whatever you want to call it, but there's no denying that this is serious money for the Inside Out franchise. Inside Out 2 leads a pack of June releases that have resulted in dramatic box office rebound. Not so long ago, domestic box office revenue was running 23% behind last year. Now that deficit has narrowed to 17% according to Comscore. That's actually incredible. Like 2023 wasn't necessarily the best year in terms of box office compared to a year like 2019, which is totally insane. But everybody was talking about the May Massacre and predicting doom and gloom. But it just shows how one Disney cartoon and one Illumination cartoon, and we have a Marvel film on the horizon. If you have a few of those major franchises, like they truly are tentpole films supporting the entire slate or the entire movie industry. And anytime any of those movies are postponed or delayed or anything like that, it just throws the whole marketplace uh, into a state of total chaos. But getting back to the article... Another movie assisting the mini boom is Paramount's A Quiet Place Day One, which is holding at number three in its second weekend with a three-day gross of $21 million for an impressive 10-day domestic tally of $94.4 million. The prequel scared up the loudest three-day debut of the series last week and went opening to $52 million. Yeah, the safe bet at this point is that uh, Paramount will continue to make A Quiet Place movies until the end of time as long as they continue to generate these kinds of numbers because I can't remember the exact budget. Actually, let me look it up. I think the budget was only like $67 million. A Quiet place day one budget boom 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 uh 67 million look at me I, I still have some of my marbles intact in spite of the hangover but if you're making a movie for 67 million and after two weeks it's already clearing these kinds of numbers yeah that is a very healthy vibrant energetic franchise and what is otherwise sometimes described as an anemic marketplace a24 specialty pick Maxine opening Friday plays number four with an estimated 6.7 million from 2,450 cinemas, which is not a bad start for a specialty slasher pick that boasts a hard R rating. An ode to 1980s exploitation and horror, Maxine completes Ty West trilogy starring Mia Goth. The film received a B cinema score, a high grade for a horror slash slasher film. Yeah, Maxine, I love seeing A24 do this well. I love seeing Mia Goth do this well. I love seeing Ty West do this well. I just wasn't the world's biggest fan of the movie like if it had just been called Maxine without triple X in the title and I know it's the third film in the X series so triple X can just mean it's the third but if you're making a movie about a porn star and you have triple X in the title I'm expecting the movie to deliver a little something extra apart from just your usual uh, slasher fare and maybe that means I'm just a, uh, a dirty old man guilty but I thought the movie was uh, a little bit chicken shit when it came to its depiction of violence and sexuality if you're going to make the uh, the third film in what's a, an otherwise very popular series like fucking go for it at this point what do you have to lose you're making the third movie you've already made your money but I do like seeing A24 making money off these movies that are not necessarily like art house fair or specialty fair like I like how they they've um they're making a lot of legitimate stabs into full-blown genre films. And between this and Civil War, yeah, A24, they're, they're not having a bad year in 2024 at all. And I know they also just recently raised a pile of cash. So 
onwards and upwards for A24. I just hope as A24 gets bigger and more ambitious that the reach won't exceed their grasp and that they, they lose this brand that they've very, very carefully cultivated over the last 10 years. Because I feel like when it comes to theatrical distribution, A24's brand is as reliable and as beloved as a brand like the Criterion Collection on Blu-ray. It stands for quality, stands for taste, and you can always assume that in any given year, A24 will crank out a few uh, really cool flicks. But getting back to Pamela, Sony's Bad Boys Ride or Die had enough gas left in the tank in its fifth outing to place number five with 6.6 .6 million from 2,664 sites for a hefty domestic tally of 177.4 million. It's possible the pick could swap places with Maxine when final week grosses are tallied. Kevin Costner's big budget Horizon and American Saga Chapter 1 falling to number 6 continues to struggle to find its audience. The 100 million period western which runs just over 3 hours tumbled 50% in its second weekend to roughly 5.5 million from 3,325 theaters for a domestic total of 22.2 .2 million. As of right now, distributor Warner Brothers hasn't mentioned how this might impact Costner's sequel which is set to open in cinemas in August. Yeah, I'm of two minds when it comes to Horizon struggling to find its audience because on one hand, I'm rooting hard for Kevin Costner. I want his personal $38 million gamble in his own career to pay off. But as uh, a lot of people have said, this is basically a big, giant dick measuring contest between Kevin Costner and Taylor Sheridan. Taylor Sheridan has built this full-blown TV empire involving 1883, 1923, Tulsa King, uh, Yellowstone, obviously. Kevin Costner quit the hit show to go off and make his own movie franchise of four movies, which looks and feels more like a TV show than an epic Western, so much so that, you know, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, there's no ending to the movie. It just seamlessly goes right into this highlight reel for the upcoming film. I was like, all right, well then, maybe you should have just made this for HBO or for Netflix or someone like that, if that's the kind of uh, style you're going to... I mean, John Ford and Sam Peckinpah did not end their movies with highlight reels <laughs> for what was to come afterwards, like when John Ford made... Um, I guess Ford Apache was the first of his, uh, of his cavalry trilogy. He didn't do a highlight reel teasing uh, She Wore a Yellow Ribbon. He just let Ford Apache be a standalone movie. But I do hope that Horizon will find, I guess... It'll need to find an audience either through DVD and Blu-ray or through digital sales or whatever because I would like to see more Westerns get made. I mean, I've been doing a lot of Western videos on this channel recently. I reviewed Horizon. I'll leave that uh, review down in the description below. I did a breakdown with David Lambert, and then we also did a review of the new Blu-ray release of uh, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, which was recently put out by Criterion. So I love watching Westerns. I love discussing Westerns, but I'm not going to give a movie a pass just because it is a Western. And when I saw Michael Rooker the other day saying like, oh, well, TikTok's ruined your brains. Like, no one's appreciating this, uh, this great Western. I'm like, tap the brakes. It's not a great Western. I have seen dozens, maybe even a hundred great Westerns. Horizon is not one. It's fine. It's serviceable. But I'm not surprised at all that this movie is underperforming. And um, like I said, I'm of two minds when it comes to the film. But just to close out the article, last year, Utah-based studio Angel Studios made headline when its film Sound of Freedom opened to $14.2 million on July 4th, enough to top the chart and beat the likes of Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. By the end of the long holiday corridor, its domestic tally was north of $41 million. Angel Studios, supported in large part by faith-based moviegoers, isn't replicating that success with this year's Sound of Hope, the story of Possum Trot, an inspirational drama about a family that adopts 22 kids. Holy crap! Um, I'm not interested in uh, seeing that movie, but I guess high five to that family that is willing to take in 22 children. Possum Trot isn't a sequel to Sound of Freedom, although both films earned a coveted A-plus cinema score. Possum opened on July 4th and earned a combined $4.7 million on Wednesday and Thursday, according to Angel. For the weekend, it opened to $3.6 million to place number nine, according to Comscore. Now, as far as my own personal taste is concerned, I'm about as interested in faith-based movies as I am in children's animation that is not for me. It's like, you know, like Christian, Christian-themed rock and roll. There's an audience for it. I'm just not the, uh, the audience. But I do like a nice, diversified marketplace that is trying to serve the tastes and preferences of a wide range of people. I feel like sometimes there's too much... Um, I guess like there's too much of a monoculture when it comes to what Hollywood is offering, where it's like just these bland, four-quadrant, PG-13, $200 million movies that are designed to be successful, but not necessarily have long shelf lives or be enduringly popular. Uh, I like movies that are slightly lower in budget, that are a little more specific in who they're targeting. So, I mean, an A-plus cinema score, that is nothing to sneeze at. It shows that this movie will have some, uh, some legs, and it'll continue to have some endurance. I just won't be first in line. Like... 
I don't mind when, when religion is in a movie if it's organic to the story. Like if you watch a lot of uh, westerns, there will be characters like in Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. I want to tell you one last thing, personal kid. It's going to be a loose rope and a long drop. What good people are coming just to see your poor sinner spirit meet the devil. And I'm aiming to please them for making sure you say the Lord's Prayer before you do a proper cakewalk and soil your drawers. It might not necessarily be a religious character who is like warm and fuzzy. I mean, R.G. Armstrong and Pat Garrett is pretty goddamn ruthless. But I like religion where it's just a part of the overall fabric as opposed to like the sole purpose of the film. But maybe I shouldn't... Um, uh, dismiss Sound of Hope too quickly because, like I said, I haven't seen the movie and I really don't know what the fuck I'm, uh, I'm a t what I'm talking about. So I'm looking ahead at my calendar. I've got a Long Legs on Thursday. I'm very fired up. I think Long Legs might end up being the biggest horror film of the summer, or at least based on uh, how people are initially reacting. Friday night, I'm actually going to be in Texas at the Comedy Mothership down in uh, Austin. I'm very excited to check that place out for the first time. And then the following week, I've got uh, Twisters, an early access screening, along with uh, Cobra Kai Part 1 for Season 6. So some interesting stuff on the horizon, but there are not a ton of new releases that I'm uh, going to be sinking my teeth into. So I'll have to do, uh, I'll have to put on my thinking cap and find some other videos to make, apart from obviously House of the Dragon Breakdowns. Very fired up to see House of the Dragon Season 2, Episode 4 this evening. Even if I was a little disappointed with episode three, I mean, I fucking love that show, and it's uh, definitely my, my, my favorite part of the entertainment offerings this summer so far. But let me know what you think down in the comments below. It's interesting seeing three movies in the top five have double-digit uh, returns because, you know, like a couple years ago, the top five would always be movies that are in the double digits, sometimes up in like you know, in the 30 and 40 million range. And while we still have a long way to go to get back to those heights, it seems like we are kind of adjusting back to the new normal now that um, all the movies that were delayed due to last year's strike are now being rolled out. So hopefully from now through December, we'll more or less have a, uh, a regular a regular release schedule and a regular box office, um, uh, see, see a series of regular box office returns. But yeah, I have a feeling that Deadpool and Wolverine, it's going to blow people's doors off later this month. And so very excited to see what that movie has in store for us. But time to wrap this sucker up. Hope you enjoyed the video. If so, please consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, hitting that notification bell. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.